This is episode number 178 of the Mixology Talk podcast. And I know we usually talk about classic cocktails and ingredients and stuff like that. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, the world is still a bit of a mess and it's been that way for a while. Um, and everything's just a bit too heavy. Um, so we thought we would take a nice mental break and focus on something a little bit more fun. Um, and I don't know about you, but anytime I have a beautiful tropical drink in front of me, I can't help but smile. So in June, we will be focusing on Tiki Month. And what better way to really celebrate that than to interview uh, Jeff Beach Bumberry. He is, um, for anybody that knows him, um, very much responsible for kind of a resurgence in the Tiki movement um, and really focusing on high quality ingredients, the way they used to be served. And uh, yeah, it's just I'm really excited for this interview and I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. Cheers, everyone. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Mixology Talk podcast. So as everyone knows, um, every month on the Facebook group, we focus on one particular topic. And this month, we're going to be talking about tiki and covering tiki. So there's nobody better to cover this subject than Don, or no, sorry, Beach Bump Barry. I apologize. I was doing a bunch of research before that, and uh, obviously Don Beach Bumper and everything came up. Um, but Thank you so much for joining us, Beachrum. Um, I definitely appreciate it. And uh, yeah, welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be here virtually. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So we're still in the middle of kind of the um, coronavirus, COVID kind of lockdown. So uh, I think everyone's hopefully had some time to kind of listen in and, and have some fun, um, gain some extra knowledge and stuff. So I'll be completely honest. I know very little about Tiki, um, but I know that craft cocktails and tiki are pretty much in, very much intertwined these days um so i'd love to kind of talk to you um a little bit about the origin story but before we do for anybody that doesn't know um beach bomb you're you're kind of the, the best quote i heard to describe you is you're the indiana jones of tiki would that be a fair kind of comparison um i don't wear the same hat <laughs> Um, but I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, yeah, you've written quite a few books. Um, I think we were talking, it was like seven books um, in, a, in a subject. You own a restaurant. You've also worked with Cocktail Kingdom for your own bar line, from my understanding. Um, and that's kind of just the tip of the iceberg of, the, of what you've been up to over the last 20 years or so uh, in this particular subject, correct? Yeah, there's also the uh, Total Tiki Cocktail Recipe app, which um, is, during this whole lockdown, self-quarantine thing, has experienced quite a resurgence in popularity. Uh-huh. That's with uh, Martin Duderoff, the guy who invented that with me. Perfect. Excellent. Um, so yeah, you definitely know your way around Tiki, um, and I'm hoping you can kind of bring us through kind of the evolution and kind of the history of Tiki to kind of give people an understanding of where it came from, um, some of the struggles it had in the past, and kind of where it's going, um, if you don't mind kind of starting with a, in the beginning. Well, you mentioned um, craft cocktails and Tiki cocktails as if they're two separate things, and I think the first thing we should addresses that what we now call tiki drinks, which is a 21st century term, by the way, they were never called that back during the 1930s to 1970s golden age. Back then they were called either tropical drinks or exotic cocktails. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we're stuck with the nomenclature now. It's causing all kinds of semantic problems for the whole cultural appropriation and everything, but we'll just call it tiki drinks. It's easier. Um, so tiki drinks were the first post-prohibition craft cocktails. Um, the people making them in 1934 all the way up through the 70s, for the most part, especially the progenitors of the movement, uh, Don the Beachcomber, you mentioned, and later Trey Vic, they used only fresh squeezed citrus. They had their own in-house syrups and tinctures. Um, they had their own pre-mixed uh, syrups and, um, and many cases, liqueurs. Um, very inventive, forward-thinking. You could say that Don was the first practitioner of... Uh, farm-to-glass cocktails in California. Um, and uh, until the cocktail renaissance in the early 20th century, I mean, those were the, if you want to craft cocktails, that was basically what you had until 
the whole dark ages of the cocktail, which occurred around 1980, 19, 1980s and 1990s, where you couldn't get a decent drink anywhere. Um, but let's not get into that just yet. We're getting ahead of ourselves. <laughs> um, oh. No, go ahead. Sorry, I think I lost you there for a second. The whole thing started um, the day after Prohibition ended um, in December, late December, no, December 7th, early December 1933, where everybody had been gearing up to open bars the day after repeal was enacted. And one of those people was uh, Ernest Raymond Beaumont Gant, uh, who renamed himself Don the Beachcomber when his little tiny bar in Hollywood became famous shortly after he opened it as Don's Beach Cafe. Um, that was the first tiki bar, and it was the first place to get a tiki drink. Don did not call them tiki drinks. He called them rum rhapsodies. Uh, and his place was sort of like a South Seas bar, or a Hawaiian bar. Nobody called them tiki bars. Back then. But it was the Big Bang. It all started right there, and it all came from his mind. Um, and... What he served was what he called rum rhapsodies, as I mentioned, and these were revolutionary drinks in the U.S. Uh, nobody tasted anything like them, uh, especially after 12 years of Prohibition. By the time Prohibition ended, any decent bartender with any good skill set, what we would now call craft bartenders, they had fled to the Four Winds. Uh, they, they went to Havana. They went to Venice, Italy. They went to Paris. They went to London to ply their trade legally as bartenders. Mm -hmm. um, every, everybody else became a shoe salesman or a soda jerk or what have you. And the art of mixology just basically crashed and burned all through the 1920s and up through repeal. So uh, Don was in a unique position at that point for several reasons. Uh, one is that he knew something that nobody else who was tending bar at that point in America knew, which was rum. Uh, if people knew Bacardi, uh, they could make a daiquiri, but aside from Bacardi Carta Blanca, you know, white rum, they didn't know anything about it. They had never touched anything else. Um, part of the reason for that was that rum was an extremely unpopular beverage uh, from the late 19th century all the way to prohibition. Uh, it had gotten kind of a tarnished reputation in the U.S. as the drink of sailors, bums, um, you know, uh, hobos. Ernest Hemingway referred to alcoholics as rummies. It was a down-and-out person's drink. Anybody with any means or culture or sophistication wanted to drink scotch or gin. Mm -hmm. And not even so much cocktails. I mean, yeah, maybe a martini or an old-fashioned, but mostly a slug of scotch was considered a uh, respectable drink for a guy, two-fisted, red-blooded American male, or martini if you wore a top hat and uh, you know ran a company. But rum was for the lower orders. Um, so there was a shift there during Prohibition in that uh, people could no longer get scotch or gin without threatening their own lives. Um, no matter what it said on the label, the gin was probably made by bootleggers or gangsters, and it probably had all kinds of um, impurities in it that literally could kill you. And the same goes for anything with a label that said scotch whiskey. Um, bourbon whiskey, everyone knew would have been picked because the, sh the distilleries were shuttered. The only things that were relatively safe to drink because you knew that they had been smuggled all across the U.S. border were Canadian whiskey from the north or Caribbean rum from the south or via the rum runners operating out of Nassau. So if you bought a bottle of rum on the black market, um, chances were that what the label said was what was in the bottle. Um, and again, same with Canadian whiskey. So people who normally would have preferred scotch or whiskey found themselves drinking rum because they knew it wouldn't kill them. It wasn't their first choice. It wasn't their second choice. Um, and when Prohibition ended, um, rum was thrown back into uh, the doldrums. Nobody wanted it anymore. Oh, thank God we can get scotch and we could get gin and all those bourbon distilleries and then Padlock now have nice 12-year-aged bourbon <laughs> in, their, in their rick houses. So 
rum once again fell into immediate disfavor and the rum runners were all overstocked and distributors couldn't get rid of the stuff fast enough. Um, if you wanted to buy a case of scotch, they might force you to buy four cases of rum just to, just to unload their inventory. Don, as I said, was in a unique position here because he knew what to do with rum. He'd been to the islands. Uh, he'd been to Jamaica. He'd been to uh, Cuba. He'd been to Martinique. And he knew about different kinds of rum and he knew how to mix them. And he found himself able to buy really good age stuff, 10, 12, 15 year old rum uh, from all those various regions for 70 cents a quart. Um, so although I don't know for sure, I'm, my guess is that frugality was the mother of invention there and that he was making rum drinks because they were cheap to make and he knew enough about the base spirit to be able to play with it and do something original with it. Um, but just adopting rum for cocktails wasn't the revolutionary thing. The revolutionary thing was how he took a 200-year-old Jamaican punch formula, you know, sweet, sour, strong, and weak that we all know, the Jamaican uh, planter's punch formula, one of sour, two of sweet, three of strong, four of weak. The uh, Most of the people listening to this show probably have a tattoo of that on their arm. But just in case, you know, uh, sour being lime juice, sweet being sugar, uh, strong being dark Jamaican rum, and weak being either water or ice. Classic 200-year punch formula. Um, and if you look at all of the other indigenous Caribbean drinks um, from different islands and with different kinds of rum, it's the same thing. Uh, Cuba's daiquiri is white rum, lime, and sugar. The planter's punch is dark Jamaican punch rum, lime, and sugar. The tea punch from Martinique is rum agricole or um, rum arame uh, from, the, from that island. Um, with uh, lime and sugar and all the way down, you know, to the lesser Antilles. So um, what Don did was he took this very simple formula and he cubed it, squared it, he dimensionalized it um, instead of just lime juice. Is, well, what if we have a more complex citrus blend? What if we mix lime and grapefruit together? What happens? Do the two cancel each other out? Is the flavor muddied or do they enhance each other? And do you get a more interesting citrus element? Um, so, okay, you discover that it works out fine. And then you go to the sweet, you do the same thing with the sweet instead of just sugar. Oh, well, what if you infuse the sugar with cinnamon and make a cinnamon syrup? Um, and what if you put that into the drink with your lime and grapefruit and then add more sweet layers to it? What, what happens if you mix cinnamon and pomegranate, like a grenadine with cinnamon syrup, do those two work? Do they make a more complex, sweet uh, element in the drink? Yeah, okay, well, why stop there? Why not add falernum, which is already a complex compound syrup from Barbados with almond, clove, lime peel, um, ginger, and see if that works with your grenadine and your cinnamon syrup. So you have a very, very complex sweet element to go with your more complex sour element. And here's Don's genius, and here's where... Uh, everything coalesced and came together for him to create this new kind of drink. He did the same thing with the strong element that he did with the sweet and sour. Um, he took rums of different body character strength and he mixed them together to create a base spirit in the same glass that no one bottle could have given him. And this was revolutionary. Uh, as far as I know, um, nobody had done this before Don. Uh, Jerry Thomas was in his 1862 book, Mixed Rum and Cognac, but nobody, you know, not in his book and not in any other book have I seen, were there different kinds of rum mixed together. Um, you'd never think of doing that in an old-fashioned. Like, why would you put more than one different whiskey in an old-fashioned? I mean, the thing about bourbon is that although there are differences between brands, differences in proof, differences in age, et cetera, et cetera, if you did a blind taste test of 10 of them, they'd all taste pretty much like bourbon. Same thing with most London gins, tequilas, but rum was its own weird animal. I mean, rum had a vast spectrum of flavor. Um, different islands developed different distillation, aging, blending methods to the point that um, the category of white, brown, or, or, uh, and, and dark rum was meaningless because if you took a white rum from Havana, which was a column distilled, uh, and you know, column distilled off of um, white rum, um, unaged, and you compare that with a rum, rum agricole from Martinique. The rum agricole was distilled from fresh pressed sugarcane juice, sugarcane rum. The Puerto Rican rum was from molasses. 
Uh, right there, you have an enormous difference, uh, and one does not taste anything like the other, but they're both white rums, technically. And then you get into the other categories, brown rums, dark rums, rums from Jamaica, rums from Barbados, rums from uh, Guyana, uh, rums from Trinidad. They all had different characteristics. And that vast flavor spectrum enabled him to play with the base flavor the way you couldn't really do with whiskey or gin. And he did that, um, for example, he might take a white Puerto Rican rum, dry floral rum, and he might mix it with his dark Jamaican rum in the same drink. That heavy, molassesy, sweet, um, high ester rum mixed with the a drier Puerto Rican rum, the two rums would inform each other. Um, and they wouldn't fight each other. They'd create uh, a base flavor in the glass that was more interesting than either one of them singly. Wouldn't stop there. We might take a, an overproof Demerara rum from Guiana, which has a very smoky, charred wood taste, and add that top note to it. Um, and he did that with 70 different drinks. Um, 33 of them have planter's punch DNA. I mean, it's all, uh, they're all planter's punch variations. And his most famous drink, the one that really kickstarted Tiki and made it a national fad, the zombie was basically one of those drinks. It was a turbocharged planter's punch. It was exactly what I described. It was lime and grapefruit. Um, the sweet element was cinnamon sh syrup, grenadine, and phalarum. And then the three rums that I described, that was the rum base for the zombie. So it was a, basically a planter's punch cubed. And this resulted in some amazingly rich, um, uh, mysteriously flavored drinks that he took to the next level in terms of garnish as well. Uh, he'd serve drinks in coconuts, he'd serve them in pineapples, he'd um, create ice shells inside the drink that rose up like little igloos in the glass, um, and he was using fresh, of course, fresh mint and fresh peel to um, accentuate the drinks, orchids. Well, no, actually, he was pre-orchid at that point. But um, anything he could think of to beautify the drink, which was already in itself kind of a work of art in the glass, and this took Hollywood by storm almost immediately. Um, you had movie stars, um, executives. Uh, you had Howard Hughes. Um, he, was, he was a regular. Uh, Marlena Dietrich, Orson Welles, the Marx Brothers. You name it, they all went to Don's, and that put the place on the map in terms of press. And in no time, in like uh, three years, there were 150 copycats of Don's across the country, and the Tiki wave began, the first wave of Tiki. And they all basically copied Don's menu. Don's menu was the template for, because they, these, uh, these drinks didn't exist. They, they were invented by Don pretty much. Um, the only way they could get them was to steal his bartenders and offer them more money or through industrial espionage, just to sit at the bar and see what was being done and see if they could reverse engineer the drinks um, or what have you, because he kept the recipes very close to his chest and never published them. Um, so that was, the, that was the start of it. It all started with Don. Uh, he basically created what we call tiki drinks and a tiki bar. And this was the 1930s. Um, it took off because there was another dimension to all this, which was the atmosphere of the bar itself. Uh, Don decorated the bar with all of the, these Polynesian artifacts from his travels. He used to crew uh, merchant freighters in the Pacific in the 20s. And he had a vast collection of stuff by the time he got through doing that. So he created this exotic, transportive, little sort of Hollywood movie set atmosphere, which also became the template for tiki bars across the country. The atmosphere was uh, probably over 50% of it. You know, even if the drinks weren't made right to Don's specifications in these ripoff places, the decor was pretty compelling at a time when we were going through a crisis kind of like we are now. I mean, it was the Depression. Um, and people were freaked out and upset and paranoid. And if they had a job, they were worried about losing it. And if they didn't have one, they were worried about getting evicted or tossed in jail for, you know, or, or declaring bankruptcy. And um, uh, you, got a, you couldn't afford a vacation, but you could afford an hour or two in Don the Beachcombers or one of the copycat tiki bars that would transport you for a little South Seas vacation you know, uh, with these exotic cocktails to... Uh, sort of enhance everything. So the, the formula works really, really well. Um, and it might still have petered out after a few years, as fads do. Um, but then there was a second wave. Tiki got another shot in the arm in the 1940s, which kept it going, which was World War II. Up to that point, the greatest conflagration known to humankind. And it, people 
were out of the depression because of the uh, the war economy, but they were all going off to get killed. Uh, and they were worried about German and Japanese invasion on the home front at that point. And, uh, and everybody was freaked out and paranoid. And, it was, and we didn't know we were going to win the war at that point. Um, there was great uncertainty in the air. And Tiki became even more popular. Uh, people needed that mini vacation, as my friend Robert Hess called it, um, the cocktail scholar, um, which sums it up perfectly in two words. Tiki offered a little mini vacation with alcohol. Um, and, uh, so that kept it going up through the forties. Uh, and we're so we're in the second decade of this craze now. And then, well, all right, you might think that it's had its run. Um, you're coming up on 20 years into the 1950s, the 1950s, but something else is going on in the 1950s. We were in the atomic age. We were in the age when Russia might drop an A-bomb on us and wipe out Earth as we know it. And, of course, the Russians were just as afraid that we were going to do that to them. They didn't have tiki bars. Um, <laughs> they just had vodka, so I think got the better end of that deal. But, um, but the fact was, people were paranoid. They woke up thinking, this might be the, my last day on Earth. Um, couple that with the sort of stifling Eisenhower-era conformity of the 1950s, um, the man in the gray flannel suit, you know, um, everybody towing the line, um, it was a very repressed time, and it was a very paranoid time. And then you had the Red Scare, uh, McCarthyism, the, the witch hunts, was added another layer of crappiness onto everything. So people flocked to tiki bars. Um, in, it, it was more than ever at the time to anesthetize yourself with a zombie in a, in a nice, pretty South Seas environment. Um, so you're going into your fourth decade in the 1960s. Uh, we still have a booming post-war economy, and these places were kind of entrenched at this point. They've been going strong for like 30 years, and it just became a question of like bigger and better. Let's build a better mousetrap. Let's spend. Uh, by that time, uh, the Contiki organization, uh, which were in Sheraton hotels, and Trader Vic's chain of restaurants, which were in Hilton's, were um, competing with each other for the most fabulously expensive decor. Um, they had restaurants with indoor waterfalls and uh, lava rock lagoons. And, um, you know, you're talking about a million dollar interiors in 1960s money. And it was all to outdo everybody else and to get to, to get that market share for this still popular thing. At that point, it was just, it was just leisure. People were spending their leisure dollars in these places. It wasn't so much a question of we have to escape reality. It's like, this is just a really cool place to go. And they were still really popular. And they also, we should mention, these were fine dining places. These were not Jimmy Buffett-style beach bars or, or uh, burger places. These were a very expensive night out. Um, this was, you know, valet parking, um, really high tab. Um, you know, you had a staff of 40 people, and you had uh, this amazing uh, million-dollar interior to pay off, and um, and you were charging top dollar for this. It's because it was considered chic. It wasn't considered tacky at all. Of course, that finally happened. Uh, things kind of went south in the 70s, um, not so much because people thought it was tacky, but because there was a countercultural shift. Um, history finally caught up with tiki um you know generally the worse things got in the world the better it was for tiki but the vietnam war changed all that um and the whole idea of an exotic otherness this south seas or far east land of mystery and enchantment was kind of blown out the window when you were watching the cbs news every night color footage of kids being napalmed in jungles and uh and GIs coming back in body bags, and that kind of like killed it. The rise of the counterculture was sort of a rise against cocktail culture. Uh, cocktails were what your parents drank. Well, your parents who voted for Nixon, they were drinking cocktails. And you, were, you were shifting the paradigm from recreational drinking to recreational drugs. People were smoking or snorting to have a good time. They weren't drinking Mai Tais or zombies anymore. And it became something old-fashioned and uncool. Uh, and then finally, Along with all of cocktail culture, it wasn't just tiki cocktail culture. Everything died out in uh, the 1980s, and drinking just became, uh, you know, for to a large extent, just uh, prepackaged mixes and industrial food. Uh, you know, the industrial food culture sort of put the final nail in the coffin, where you had a can of pina colada or a can of canned mai tai, and uh, if you weren't just pouring them right out of the can, you were using a sweet and sour mix instead of freshly squeezed. 
citrus uh, or using roses lime juice instead of squeezing a lime uh, and uh, you know cheaper less interesting rums etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh, that was basically the scene up until our 21st century renaissance in the u.s and then how did you get exposed to tiki what was your first kind of initial uh experience with tiki that kind of got you thinking about it well, it was uh, back in the 60s. Uh, I was about six years old, seven years old. It was like 1964. <clears throat> I was a elementary school kid in San Fernando Valley, outside of LA. And again, my parents went to one of these places because it was like the hip and cool thing to do. And uh, it was a restaurant called Ah Fong's on Ventura Boulevard, but it had been a tiki place called the Bora Bora Room. Uh, and it had spent they had spent so much money on decor that they went out of business. They couldn't recoup their costs. And the Ah Fong's Chinese chain kind of hermit crabbed in there. And they were serving, you know, basic Cantonese food, which my New York parents, that's what drew them to the place. Um, to get to the dining room, you had to walk through the bar. And the bar was, like, amazing to this day. I'll never forget my first look at it. Instead of bottles in the back bar, they had a little diorama of an island scene with huts on stilts and miniature palm trees and a resin sand beach and a little, they had a dawn to dusk lighting diorama of the sky behind it. Uh, and it was like, holy shit, you know, it's just like, this is amazing. So when I finally got old enough to drink and I could actually sit in a bar like that, I sought those places out. And that was around 1980 when I was legally able to drink. And most of them were disappearing at that point. Uh, Fong's had become a Mexican restaurant. Um, and, um, uh, there were very, there were a few places left that were still doing them, and I, when I stumbled into one of them, the Tiki Tea in East Hollywood, which is still there, third generation, family my own. Uh, I had my first basic craft cocktail there in 1980, uh, and, and it was a tiki drink, and it was amazing. And every other cocktail I ever had in any restaurant, no matter how expensive, was crap. You know, the, you would go into um, a very expensive steakhouse, if, of course, at that point, if somebody else was buying, you order a martini, and, and the, the guy would just shake some vodka in a glass in a shaker and poured into uh, it was poured into a cocktail glass it was basically you know chilled vodka no vermouth um and uh, the idea of gin you'd have to specifically ask for a gin martini and that was uh an old-fashioned forget about it man They're, they were muddling maraschino cherries and adding soda with it and it was just like a, a horrendous uh thing to behold and everything was blended. Everything was thrown into a blender. I had slushy old fashions. I had slushy uh, planter's punches. I had slushy daiquiris. I didn't really realize that these were supposed to be uh, very petite up drinks, at least in the case of the daiquiri and the old, old fashioned for years and years and years. Um, I just thought this, that drinks were just shitty. I just thought drink cocktails were bad. <laughs> and that's, uh, the only good ones I ever got were, were Poly in Polynesian places because they were still doing what they used to do. They were still squeezing citrus and they were mixing things with some care and they weren't using creep and stuff, you know. That's too funny. I, I remember when I first started bartending, um, blenders were still a huge component to it. And uh, the rule was, if you don't know how to make it, make it pink, you know, yeah. <laughs> basically. I'll be happy. <laughs> right, kind of. Like, oh man, that's a lot of, a lot of leeway there. Uh, but uh, it's amazing to kind of hear kind of the evolution of it. Like, uh, I didn't realize kind of the rich history that Tiki had and how, how it essentially is kind of the evolution of craft cocktails after prohibition. Um, that's really, really amazing. And kind of your insights and in how um, Don kind of broke his recipe down and made these amazingly intricate drinks based off of the ingredients that he knew how to make and, and his exposure to rum. It's, it's really cool um, to see kind of that origin story from somebody that has done so much research. Uh, so thank you. What? Um, so how did you get, because your first book, um, was Grog Log. I think we talked about that, um, earlier off, offline, but what was the tiki culture like? And then, because you said it kind of when the eighties hit, um, very much like regular, um, craft cocktail bars, it was kind of this no man's land of premixed cocktails and garbage, basically. Um, what was the tiki culture like when you started kind of looking into your book? That's an interesting question. Um, there really wasn't one. I mean, some of these places were still around. The Tiki Tiki neighborhood bar. There weren't really Tiki people going there. I don't think I ever saw another Tiki person. You wouldn't know if they were Tiki people, you know, because nobody was wearing a Hawaiian shirt or anything like that. Um, 
this was pre-internet. And for years and years and years, like all through the 80s, I thought I was the only person in the world that was interested in this stuff. I was the only person in the world who liked these kind of interiors and wanted to wanted them to stay and um, you know, was fascinated by the drinks and, and the, the whole uh, vanished Polynesian pop culture. You know, I thought I was the only one collecting old uh, Exotica records and uh, Hawaiian shirts and, and statues and all that stuff. You just, you know, it was just totally random if you met somebody uh, who else, else was interested. In it. And that finally happened to me around 1991. Uh, um, Anine, who you met, my, now my wife, then uh, girlfriend, took me to a cocktail party in Los Feliz up in the hills. And uh, I was talking to this guy and he said, oh, you like, I, was, I don't know how we mentioned, oh, I'd, I'd been to Easter Island. And I made a short film there. And that's, he said, oh, you like Polynesian stuff? You should talk to this guy. I know Sven. It turned out to be Sven Kirsten. And he was a German cinematographer who'd relocated to Southern California. And he, as a foreigner, um, would see the remnants of Polynesian pop culture in the, in, all over LA. Um, Tiki themed apartment buildings, restaurants, shops, everything. And they were all, you know, for the most part, decrepit and on their way to demolition. But he was interested in excavating this vanished culture. He called himself an urban archaeologist. He was the first one to, that term has since become a, a thing. And uh, I, I met him, and he was the only other person I'd ever met. I went to his, his apartment, and he had tiki mugs which he found in thrift stores the same way I had and, and various other uh, artifacts of Polynesian pop. And I was like, oh, hey, there's someone else in the world. And uh, with the same Teutonic efficiency that he um, gathered up all these artifacts because he wanted to write a book about this whole vanished pop culture phenomenon, not drinks necessarily, but he was more interested in the architecture design, um, you know, and, and the, the anthropological bit about it suburban anthropology so uh through he's th with the same thoroughness he collected other people who were interested in tiki i mean he hunted them down if somebody had published an article about something he would call up the writer and say hey would you talk to uh and in no time i found myself at his house with like five or six other people who were really seriously nerding out on this stuff like seriously geeking and i thought wow I'm not the only one, you know, and, and this, the scene grew, um, more people were thrown into it. And this was all sort of happening um, when there was this retro pop culture, alternative um, culture thing happening. You know, punk was over, new wave was over. There was just sort of like corporate rock and, and uh, MTV and all that. And, and all these old punks and, um, you know, uh, underground types were disenchanted and they started uh, swinging the pendulum all the way back to the 1950s and 60s. And you had all these people uh, listening to uh, Rat Pack, you know, Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra doing swing dancing, doing rockabilly stuff, um, getting into hot rods, you know, that whole culture. It's any alternative pop culture thing from that period people started getting into including the music the what they call lounge music which is what they would call um, the rat pack stuff and all that and that would be like easy listening it also was the ex exotica old tiki records like martin denny and all that so th there was this big tent of retro culture people all alternative culture people um who were not mainstream, who were getting interested in all this stuff. And it, and it was, there was an umbrella term called the, you know, lounge core. It was called lounge core. And Tiki was just an one element. Tiki was part of it along with swing dancing and burlesque and uh, hot rods and all that. It was just one thing. But gradually the Tiki part went off to form a subculture of a subculture. And then you had like, for want of a better word, Tiki files, people who were just interested in that. And that's, that became a uh, this sort of like um, alternative lifestyle thing for them. They went to thrift stores to buy their clothes. You know, their Aloha wear. They they all had tiki mug collections. They all had exotic music on their hi fi. They had old furniture, bamboo furniture that they gotten from swap meets or whatever. And um, the only thing missing was actual places, you know, clubs and bars to go to that uh, catered to it. And that eventually started to happen. Uh, late 90s you had some places opening up that were kind of dipping their toes in the theme um but the drinks were all terrible you know nobody knew how to make those uh and 
some of the decor was good. Some of the bands were good. There were like there were new music groups that were performing this kind of music. Like Combustible Edison um, started the Cocktail Nation, quote unquote, which was a big part of lounge core. Um, they actually would put drink recipes on their record albums and all that. And, uh, it all seems like a uh, hundred years ago, but it was actually just about 25 years ago that all this was happening. So Tiki kind of like broke off, emerged and became a thing, but it was a pop culture retro lifestyle thing. It wasn't necessarily a cocktail thing. Um, I sort of splintered off and got into the cocktails and, um, some of the people who I met through Sven, like this guy, Otto. Otto von Stroheim started a newsletter called Tiki News, and he sold it in comic book shops and you know head shops and all that. And he would throw these little back. He was a surfer and he lived in Venice Beach, and he would throw these backyard luau's. And he knew I was into the drink part, and then I was looking up all recipes and trying to figure out how to make the drinks. And he had me make punches for people. So some of these surfers and other people would come up and say, "Hey, what this is pretty good? What's in it?" And after a while, I just went to the Xerox. I went to you know. Kinko's or some other Xerox store and Xeroxed all of the decent recipes that I had found in old books or magazines or, um, you know, other paper ephemera at that time it was maybe 20 decent recipes. I put it in a little, uh, staple, you know, hand folded thing. And I would just hand it out to people say here, I mean, if this is what, this is what's in the drink. One of those found its way to a comic book publisher up in San Jose called slave labor graphics. And the guy ran it down Vado. It happened to be into Tiki. Just totally random, you know, again, just pre-internet randomness. And this was around 1994. And um, he said, hey, do you want to publish or you want to publish these as a book? And I said, well, okay. And it was this total like DIY, cheaply made, spiral bound little thing that, and Dan had never done a real book before other than a comic book or a graphic novel rather. So that you could only get it in comic book stores. Because that's the only distribution he had you know, when that came out in '98, and then, and the long story short, uh, that went over okay, and I did another one, another one. They didn't, they didn't make any money. They didn't make any impact on anybody. Not even the cocktail renaissance when that finally started to take off around '98, '99. Nobody gave a shit about tiki. In fact, tiki was considered part of the problem by craft cocktail bartenders. They all had this preconception that these were all slushy, syrupy cruise ship blender drinks, and. Why wouldn't they? Because that's all that you had gotten for the last 20 years in most places. So it took about 10 years for the for the Beach Bum books to kind of like win their way into that culture. Um, people started, like Brian Miller in New York, a death and company, discovered one of the Sip and Safari, one of my books, and, and he started serving zombies at um, death and company. And other people started serving Navy Grogs and other New York bars. And gradually, the craft cocktail movement came to understand that these actually were craft cocktails. And you started to find tropical drinks at PDT and you'd find tropical drinks at um, uh, other like really highfalutin craft bars. They would serve um, Mai Tais, first of all, when they discovered that Trader Vic's original construct for Mai Tai was a very elegant, simple craft cocktail. I and mean, that sort of found its way at menus as well. So, and now here we are. <laughs> that, that's pretty crazy. Um, and was there... Um any like how did you go about finding the a lot of these recipes um because i imagine that that was not an easy chore the problem was um and you're you're absolutely right about that chris the problem was that nothing had been written down mm -hmm. um, these were all, all very valuable trade secrets and bartenders can sometimes build entire careers out of keeping those recipes secret um if you had the knowledge if you had that little black book which and almost every time i've seen one of these recipe booklets of old school tea drinks. It was a little black book, like a little address book that could fit into your shirt pocket. And this was the grimoire. These were the secrets that no other man or woman shall know. If you, this was your passport to employment. If you knew how to make these secret recipes that Don Beach wasn't sharing with anybody, um, I talked to one guy, Bob Asmino, who worked at the Con Tiki chain, and he said that the deals that he and some of the other Tiki bartenders who knew these recipes could make were astounding. Um, you would, a restaurant would put tiki drinks on its menu to cash in on the craze, and they would hire someone like Bob because he knew how to make them. And Bob would work out a deal like, okay, um, I'll make these drinks for you, and I'll, I'll tell you what to order from your purveyors and, and vendors so that we can we have the ingredients, but I'm not going to give you the recipes. Um, and if I don't like it here or I get a better offer, I'm going to leave and take my recipes with me. That's an extraordinary amount of power for a bartender to have. And a lot of these guys built entire careers out of keeping these recipes secret. So uh, in one sense, in one very real 
and I'm forever grateful to this. I was in the right place at the right time. I was in Los Angeles in the 1990s when a lot of these old timers were still around. Um, you could walk into some Chinese restaurant and there would be uh, somebody like Tony Ramos behind the bar who used to make Navy Grogs for Frank Sinatra at Donna Beachcombers. And he'd just be there serving drinks to people at the Chinese restaurant who had no idea what he was or what he was capable of. And you would look at the drink menu and you'd see Donna Beachcombers' greatest hits on it. Go, holy crap, did you ever work at? And he said, yes, I did. And so I could actually watch and learn people actually making the drinks the way they used to be made back in the day. And they still did it that way. That's the only way they knew. Um, but if you crossed the line and said, hey, what's in that drink? Invariably, uh, Tony or Ray Boone at the TGT or, or anybody else who you happen to discover would say, rum and fruit juice. <laughs> Like, oh, okay, what about that drink? Rum and fruit juice is like, oh, okay. So they're still working apart with these things. You know, it was, it was not going to happen. Um, uh, the sole exception was that Trader Vic, um, who had a chain of 20 restaurants internationally when he died in 84, by 1970, he was so rich and so successful, he just didn't care. And he published all the recipes in his own cookbooks. Um, and made a lot of money off the books as well. So we knew how to make a decent Mai Tai and a Fog Cutter and a Scorpion and all of his most famous drinks. Mm -hmm. But even he, like my favorite drink at Trader Vic's was Navy Grog, but if you look in the Trader Vic book, he told you how to make a Mai Tai, which is his most famous drink. But when it came to uh, Navy Grog, it said uh, two ounces of Trader Vic's Navy Grog mix and three ounces of Trader Vic's Navy Grog rum. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so there were still gaps. You know? um, and... Uh, Gradually, over time, I became friends with some of these old guys who I was interviewing for the books, and, and they started to trust me, especially after I wrote the grog log and I paid homage to them. You know, they could see I wasn't just trying to rip off their stuff, mm -hmm. um, that I wasn't trying to open a bar, har har. <laughs> it's like right. Um, at the time, I had no intention of doing that. I just wanted to know what these recipes were. I, I, I was a hobbyist. I was an amateur. I wasn't in the business. Uh, I wasn't in the service industry. I did not want to open a bar or restaurant. I would have no idea how to go about any of that. I just wanted to be able to make the drinks at home, you know, because these places were disappearing. Um, and the books just came about because it was a lark. You know, they didn't make any money. Um, they took all my time away from what I should have been doing to pay the rent. Uh, so, but anyway, they started giving me, a, you know, a recipe or two or three, and I got a couple of original Beachcomber recipes that way. But it wasn't until the internet that the dam finally burst and it was through auto when he took tv news online as an online newsletter he started getting inquiries uh, one of them was from a lady named jennifer santiago whose dad richard santiago was a mater d at dawn's in the 1930s and she said well he had passed away a long time ago but she said would you would tv news be interested in some of the old recipes that he had lying around you know in his after in his effects and auto put her in touch with me for which i will always be grateful and she was a great lady and she eventually agreed to send me a Xerox copy of his 1938 notebook wow. and like this was it this was the holy grail the Rosetta Stone was all there um, stuff that I've been wondering about for years and years and years I would look at the old menus in my collection and I wonder what the hell is in that drink now the thing is they were in code I looked at that I looked at the book that I was all excited and it, they were in code. There were things like Don's mix. There were things like Don's spices, number two, Don's dashes, number one, number four. And that was all to keep his bartenders from making drinks for other people. If they hired them away, it worked really well. It worked, you know, decades after his death, it was still working. I couldn't figure out how to make the drinks, but again, right place, right time. I would meet the families of other people who's, families whose, whose father, grandfather, had been a bartender um, during those days, and they had notebooks. Sometimes you would get, you if you put the notebook side by side, a 38 against a 55, you would see that uh, some things were pretty easy to decode. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time Hank Riddle's family gave me his book from 1970, um, he had um, all of Don's dashes decoded, one through eight. He, was just, he just had a key. So gradually over many years and meeting many people, I was able to slowly and uh, ingredient by ingredient crack the code and figure out how to make the drinks. And most of those ended up in Sip and Safari in 2007. Wow. That sounds like a labor of love is not even going, getting close to kind of the dedication that, that you put through this project. And it's, yes. I've, 
Go ahead. I was an amateur. I was an amateur in every sense of the word. An amateur, you know, if you translate it from what French it mean, or Latin, it means someone who loves this or that. I don't know. I don't. I'm not, I can barely speak English. But, but, um, but I, you know, again, I was just doing it for because it sort of took over. It was almost like a detective thing at that point. It's like solving a puzzle, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and um, bringing them out there, bringing them out into the world, like publishing them was. At the time, pretty cool. Of course, I ended up creating all my own competition. Well, I did open a bar. <laughs> <laughs> well, and speaking of which, I think uh, most of the bars that actually operate um, and do tiki uh, style drinks, they I would assume most of them are using the books that you publish because once again, they probably didn't have access to the to the original recipes and formulations. Yeah, they are. In fact, they would tell me. You know, I, I didn't have to guess at it. They first of all, you look at the menu, and you know, there's no other way they could have gotten them. At least before they started going all over the place on the internet. And sure, of course was. But um, yeah, it, and but they would just tell me flat out. Yeah, I got this from your books, and I would think, cool. You know, this is great. I'm glad to see this stuff's back. It's wonderful. You know. And then I want, finally got around to opening my own place. It's like, oh, everybody's already making all these drinks. <laughs> it's like I got to come up with something new. Damn it, man! I can't keep this a secret anymore. Everybody knows. <laughs> oh man, that's too funny. So since since you published your books, uh, how has kind of the tiki style drinks and culture kind of evolved from that point? That's a great question, Chris. Uh, and I see it every time I go out on the road. Um, you know, to cocktail festivals or whatever. I'll, first place I always go in any city is the local tiki bar or restaurant. And what I'm seeing in the 21st century with younger bartenders is they're taking Don's method of experimentation and Vic's uh, method of experimentation. You know how those guys dimensionalize that basic rum, lime, and sugar tropical paradigm uh, and complicated it. Uh, people are taking that one step further. And I'm, I'm fascinated by what's happening. It's like, first of all, instead of mixing three rums in a glass, they might make tiki drinks with mezcal or mix mezcal uh, or um, got a lot, I see a lot of gin based tiki drinks. I see some Pisco based tiki drinks. They're using ingredients that were not available to Don or Vic. Um, I'm seeing drinks with flavored with lemongrass or, or saffron or um, uh, sandalwood even. Uh, people are able to make tinctures or syrups out of just about anything now. And, and there's a lot more, um, sophisticated gourmet way of thinking about making these drinks as it should be. I think that if Don uh, could come back from the dead and see what was happening, he would probably approve of everything that was being done to his recipes, all the experimentation, because that's what he did, you know, mm-hmm. to the, the old Caribbean formula. Um, in terms of the next wave, I mean, it's just, it's mostly about uh, spices. A lot of Southeast Asian spices. I'm seeing a lot of Thai spices, a lot of um, Indi- East Indian, you know, masala kind of stuff. Um, that's a big thing. I think once Amazonian fruit starts to be exported, I was in Lima, Peru uh, for a cocktail festival a couple of years ago, and um, I had a lot of uh, cocktails made with Amazonian fruits that I had never even heard of. I mean, I took pictures of these things because they look like they're from another planet, totally alien. You know, so that's another way. I think Latin America is really where you want to look next to see what the next phase of tiki is going to be. Excellent. And then when you were going through your discovery um, and interviewing everyone and kind of going through and compiling all the information around these recipes, is there any one story that really kind of sticks with you? And, and just every time you think about it, you're like, oh, that was fun. That was a great, <laughs> that was a great time. Man, there's, there's too many to mention. So that's stepping. But the first f- first three books were recipes, mm-hmm. recipes with like a few notes underneath about where the drink came from and an anecdote if there was. And I was just so single minded about recipes, about collecting recipes. Uh, and I was doing the same thing with sipping. That was going to be a recipe book. You know, I had all these beachcomber recipes finally, and I was getting the um, tiki recipes, and I was all excited. And as I was interviewing the bartenders who were, you know, who I could track down these old timers almost all of them Filipino, by the way, um, they started telling me their life stories. And their life stories were, like, unbelievable. Like, one of Bob Asmino was telling me how he was a teenage guerrilla fighter in Manila during World War II. Um, Hank Riddle's family told me about how Hank Riddle used to serve Howard Hughes, 
who, um, you know, who had a trunk full of shirts and socks. He only wore them once and he would just like uh, throw them out or give them to the bartenders and bribe people when he brought in movie stars to the bars and didn't want the press to find out about it. Um, one other bartender was a, uh, a source for gossip columnist, Hedda Hopper, who was really famous in our day. And he would tell her about the shenanigans that were going on at the beach. Covers. Like all these amazing stories. <laughs> Um, and it's just like, finally it penetrated my thick head, you know, that you need to write about these, these personalities and what was happening at the time. This is much more interesting than any recipe, you know, so the recipes became sidebars mm -hmm. and the book is divided up into, you know, chapter, chapter devoted to one, two or three personalities. Either I knew, knew them directly or interviewed them, or if they were already deceased, I interviewed their families. Uh, and, um, Man, there's so many. But one of my favorite uh, stories was actually for Potions of the Caribbean, another book I read. Um, you know, sometimes after spending the last 20 years getting more and more professionally involved in cocktails and bars and it becoming my entire life, I'm sometimes reminded of um, uh, a Newt Rockney quote. He was talking about football. He said, you have to be smart enough to understand the game and dumb enough to think it's important. And after a while, being just saturated with cocktails, I started to think that way. But it's like, this doesn't really matter. This isn't important. This is just, it's just drinks. And then you come across a guy like Joe Shalom, who was the uh, head bartender at the uh, Shepherd's Hotel in Cairo during World War II, when, when uh, Rommel and Hitler's Africa Corps were storming Egypt. And he, you know, his daughter told me the story about how he invented a drink called the Suffering Bastard. Um, which has went on to become a very famous drink in Polynesian restaurants, kind of got co-opted into being a tiki drink, just because I think just because of the name. Anyway, uh, when Rommel's uh, Africa Corps was cutting off the supply lines to uh, the hotel, which was a very ritzy, expensive hotel, um, the regulars at the Long Bar, where um, Joe was head bartender, they were all British officers, the 11th Hussars, part of Montgomery's 8th Army. And they started complaining they were getting bad hangovers because he was serving them crappy booze. So he came up with this drink, which he called the suffering bar steward or suffering bastard, depending on who he was talking to, as a hangover cure. Um, and the second battle of El Alamein um, was raging at the front, 150 miles away from the hotel. And the 11th Hussars were mobilized after a long night at Joe's bar, and they were all hung over. So Joe got an urgent cable from the front saying, please send as much of your hangover cure as you possibly can to us at the front. So he filled every thermos he could find with suffering bastard. And it was like five, four or six gallons, according to his daughter, Colette. Hired Egyptian cab drivers to take it as far up to the front as the army would let them go. And then uh, they had like army runners bringing these thermoses of suffering bastard to the British officers. And the officers won the Battle of El Alamein. They won the Second Battle of El Alamein. And Joe's drink, The Suffering Bastard, was known as the drink that won the Battle of El Alamein. Now, what's cool about this, <laughs> it's a cool story, is that the Battle of El Alamein was a turning point in World War II. A cocktail may have helped win World War II. I mean, before that, uh, I think Churchill said, before El Alamein, we couldn't win a battle. After El Alamein, we couldn't lose one. You know, so <laughs> it's all because of The Suffering Bastard, right? I mean, the <laughs> So I will never doubt the importance of cocktails again after hearing that story. That's incredible. I mean, that, that's just, it's such an incredible story. Like, <laughs> I can't even wrap my head around like all those points of just how important that was at that time to those officers stationed there. Um, Are the dogs. I, literally, yeah. It was like, holy cow. So thank you for that story. That's that might be one of the best stories I've ever heard around alcohol and cocktails. Um, so thank you. <laughs> um, so we've talked a lot about um, kind of the history and kind of bringing up to speed on, on the culture of Tiki, all the kind of discovery you've done um, around that. Um, I got to ask though, what is your desert Island cocktail? Uh, good question, man. Um, I think it's gotta be, the Navy Grog. That was the first great Trader Vic drink I had when I, I, you know, back when I could not afford to that go to that restaurant. I was either do your laundry or go to Trader Vic's, and it blew my mind. I had no idea what was in it. I couldn't figure out all, any of the really elusive, teasing flavors of it. 
Uh, and that's kind of what started me on the quest of trying to figure out what was in these drinks. Um, and I'll still, if I ever do get ambitious at home and I've got the ingredients, that's the drink I'll make for myself as a, as a Navy grog. Now, can you break down your uh, recipe of choice for us? Yeah, I mean, he he did a riff on Don the Beachcomber's original, which is mm -hmm. still all the best. You can't top it. Um, it's three quarters of an ounce of uh, white grapefruit juice, three quarters of an ounce fresh lime juice, uh, three quarters of an ounce of um, honey syrup, probably uh, two to one, I would say, or maybe one ounce of a one to one. And then he does, there's that beachcomber thing of mixing three rums. And in Vic's case, he didn't change a thing about it. It was an ounce of uh, white Puerto Rican, an ounce of uh, dark Jamaican, like um, Caruba or Myers black, and then an ounce of uh, Demerara. And back in their day, they would use Lemon Heart 86 proof. Uh, closest thing now would be either uh, Hamilton 86 Guiana or um, another beautiful rum is uh, El Dorado 8-year Demerara rum. Only the eight year though, I'll do the five or the three, it's gotta be the eight, to give you that smoke, you know, that little bit of charred wood taste. And, um, and just shake all that up with a dash. I use an empty Angostura bitters bottle um, and just put in two or three dashes uh, of um, allspice liqueur, pimento liqueur. Uh, and there's several brands in the market of that. The Hamilton, but you use more of it if you're using Hamilton, it's very delicate. Um, St. Elizabeth is good. That's the one that um, we use at Latitude, mostly. Perfect. I'm going to have to try that one now. <laughs> yes, shake it, strain it into a, a double fashion glass with um, fresh ice and a little bit of mint, and it's a beautiful thing. Excellent. Well, I have my homework cut out for me tonight, that's for sure. <laughs> homework, that's what we're calling it. <laughs> <laughs> research, research, I'll, I'll call it that. Um, Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Um, we've you've been very generous with your time, and I can't thank you enough for sharing kind of the the backstory and how you got involved with it, and kind of bringing us up to um, kind of where we are now with tiki um, in craft cocktails. Uh, it, it's been really great to kind of understand more of its history and see how it is essentially um, you know the first craft cocktail. Um, environment after prohibition that's, that's really amazing to hear um so is there anything that you'd like to promote anything you'd like to share um uh with the audience well yeah um i mean since we can't go to bars yet at least in new orleans i don't know about your cities but um a lot of people are drinking at home now uh and the two books that i would recommend that i've done that have a, a fund of these kind of stories we were talking about and also these uh, original tiki drinks would be um, Potions of the Caribbean and also uh, Sip and Safari, the 10-year expanded edition, which came out a couple of years ago. Uh, those are both from Cocktail Kingdom, and uh, or you can go on Amazon and get them. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a good way to pass the time while you're self-quarantining. Uh, if, you're, if you're not really into books, then there's the Total Tiki app, if you have an iOS or iPhone or whatever. Uh, that has almost every recipe from all seven books <clears throat> under one roof. So there's almost 300 recipes there, and that should keep you busy for a while. Uh, and um, other than that, I hope by the end of July, Latitude will be open. We'll see you all at the bar. Perfect. And Latitude, uh, when everyone goes to New Orleans, definitely got to check that one out for sure. Um, so once again, thank you so much. And um, yeah, I really appreciate your time. Thank you. It was a fun hour. I Absolutely. Appreciate it. All right. So once again, thanks to Jeff Beach Bumberry for his time and also sharing a lot of his stories and research along the way to kind of resurrecting uh, tiki drinks and giving them a, a whole other layer of respect. Um, I learned a ton about the history of tiki and I hope you enjoyed that interview as much as I did. Um, so we'll have links in the show notes to all the things that we uh, talked about and definitely go check out uh, his books as well. It's a great way to kind of pass the time if we're still under quarantine and you're looking for just that little bit of sunshine in your day. Um, that tiki cocktail is a great way to go. So we'll have some more podcasts for everyone in the future, but until then, I hope you're staying safe, healthy, and uh, I can't wait to see everybody in the barn in the near future. Cheers, everyone.